Paul needed to get Timothy's undivided attention. Mm -hmm. What I'm about to tell you, Timothy, is of the utmost importance. So before I give you this task, I want you to understand just how important it is. Paul knew, Paul knew, he knew there'd be times when preaching would be accepted and other times it would be rejected. Mm -hmm. We don't preach based on the crowd's acceptance or rejection. Right. So I'm charging you. This is your task. But I'm not just charging you alone. I've got some witnesses. I charge you before God and I charge you before the Lord Jesus Christ. And oh, by the way, you'll be judged by how you carry out this responsibility. Yes. We have to be careful. Those of us that God has called to preach the word when we stand here, yes. we have an awesome responsibility. Yes. Preaching, preaching, preaching is imminent in the church. In spite of those who think that preaching has run its course, we got to keep preaching. Yes. Because it is by the foolishness of preaching that God has chosen to save them that believe. Every preach moment, every preaching experience should have, number one, God as the focus, the edification of his body as his aim, and salvation and loss, the ultimate goal. Amen. A second pillar, a second of the pillar of the church is prayer. What is prayer? Prayer is a place of contact between God and the human heart. Yes. It's a place where we can make our confession, a place where we can carry our petition. We can intercede for those we love. We can give God the thanks and the praise that he's so worthy of. And prayer is not words that we hope some far off God will hear. No, 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 no. Prayer actually urges us into the very presence of God. It's a living place. A place we can find any time. A place we can find anywhere. Any room in your house. Any time, day or night. Any place on your job, in the streets. I got a witness from Paul and Silas. You can even find him in jail. If you yeah. We can choose to be in God's presence through prayer anytime we want to be. And that's a good place to be. Yes, 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 it's yes, a good yes, place. Yes. When you're in God's presence, you receive blessings. Yes. In God's presence, we are confronted with the awesomeness of a holy God. I see myself, oh, so undone sometimes. Mm -hmm. I see all of the unkept areas in my life. I see where I should have brushed my hair or washed my face. All of the things that I really don't want to see. When I'm in God's presence, I see these things. And I have to call out like Isaiah, woe is me. I am undone, a man of unclean lips. It helps me to see all of the blight of sin in my life. But here's the good part about it. Whenever I'm in God's presence, whenever I see all of the rough, tough, Toe down, jacked up parts of my life. Mercy and grace is always traveling along with me. Every time. Every time. I don't know why. Just they hang out together, I guess. <laughs> so I find mercy and grace in his presence. Tell me like you tell Isaiah, your iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged. Oh, for the God, for the God. Yes. Being in God's presence empowers us. After God cleans us up and sets us about our task, right. we answer the call of God. So who will I sin? Who will go for me? We answer the call. God empowers us with his word to go and tell this people. Prayer is not new to the church. No, it's not new to the church. Almost 800 years before the birth of the church, God had already designated the church as a house of prayer. Mm -hmm. And Jesus came along and and Luke recorded its confirmation, my house is a house of prayer. Yes. The church has always been undergirded by prayer. The first century church said they all continued with one accord in prayer. Amen. Prayer was central to the church. It became a way of life. Listen to Paul's account in Acts 16 and 13. When Paul arrived in Philippi, he went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made. Paul was looking for the praying folk. The church is a place of praying folk. Prayer is a strategic weapon of the church. Get, let me say that again. Prayer is a strategic weapon of the church. This may confuse or maybe upset some of us, but the devil is really not terribly frightened about our human efforts and our potential. Did you know that? Yes. Oh, it's good. If you're tired, that's good. You should tired. If you come to Sunday school and Bible study, you do all those things, you 
may even hold a ministry position. That's good. That's good. You might be the Sunday school superintendent. A few degrees hanging on your wall. That might impress some of you. But I tell you the truth, Satan is not really worried about that. Understand me now. I don't mean to minimize our efforts and what we do for kingdom building. Not at all. We should do those things. But all of those efforts for that prayer is limited at best. Yes. I'll tell you what Satan really fears. He fears a Holy Ghost fear praying saint. Right. If you want to get on his nerve, pray. strongholds just come tumbling down. What the devil really fears is folk that know how to pray until they receive the promises of God. But the devil really fears is a God anointed prayer power church. We're concerned now about all of our energy sources that may run out, but I got news for your prayer power will never run out. Never, never, never. So how do we achieve these things? How do we achieve these results in our how can I develop a consistent and effective prayer life? What praying consistently speaks for itself is self-explanatory. Pray without ceasing, the Word of God tells us. Every opportunity we get, we don't have to be in a certain position to pray. We don't have to be in a certain place to pray. Right down the highway, we can send up a prayer. Amen. So how do I make my prayer life effective? What are some things we have to do? The first thing we need to do, prep for prayer. Get okay. yeah, yeah. Put everything aside, all distractions. Unplug your phone if you have to. It should seem so strange that when we get ready to go to God in prayer, folk that ain't calling you in 50 years come. <laughs> Got to turn off the TV. Yeah. You can't find out what Victor Newman is doing. Turn the TV off. Turn the TV off. I ain't aiming at nobody now. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. You can't have one eye open watching the side by, that's for me, and one eye trying to pray. We've got to put everything aside. We have to dedicate ourselves and be saturated with God's prayer. All right. Second, and second, that we have to preach praying in the Spirit. Praying in the Spirit is vital for an effective prayer life. Listen to the word of God's endorsement on praying in the Spirit. Ephesians 6 and 18 says, Pray in the Spirit when on all occasions. Yes. Jude 20 says, But you, dear friends, build yourselves up in your most holy faith. Pray in the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. If you feel run down and tired and you, you're out of strength and you're about to give up, go to God in prayer. Pray in the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Does that mean praying with certain words? Some of us can pray with some $64 words. Amen. Okay. Amen. Okay. Amen. You, I, I get lost sometimes with some of those words. And then some of us like me, I just use my 64 cents word. But we serve God that understand the 64 dollar word and the 64 cents word. So pray in the spirit is not about the words that you do. No, no, no. It doesn't mean how emotional you become. That's right. That's right. Yeah, I want you to understand some of us may get a little emotional and others might not show any emotion. But praying in the spirit is not about that. And it certainly doesn't mean how long you pray. Praying in the Spirit simply means allowing the Holy Spirit to guide us in prayer. Listen to this. We need to be able to listen as well as speak when we're praying to God. The Holy Spirit might want to direct us in something. If we're too busy, we won't hear the Holy Spirit. Jesus was our example of prayer. And how many of you know even Jesus in his humanity, he sometimes struggled in prayer. When Jesus was facing Calvary. He was at a point in his life where he didn't know what to pray for. Listen to his prayer. I said, my soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. Yes. To flourish, to flourish, to flourish. But Jesus allowed the Holy Spirit to take control. Listen to his, the second half of the prayer. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Spirit-led prayer makes God's purpose top priority regardless. What else should we do? We should learn to pray through. Well, what are you talking about, pray through? The word through is a preposition. It means in one side and out of the other. It means from the beginning to end. It means to continue in time toward a process. Then pray, praying through means praying about an issue until we receive an answer from God 
or until God gives us peace about it. And it is accomplished in our life. We don't see the manifestation of it, but we know God has got it, and we don't have to worry about it. Is that biblical? Yes, it is. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Prayer is a gift. Prayer is a gift that God has given us to undergird the church. But sad to say it is a gift that we reject so often. A gift that was free to you and me, but costly to Jesus. Amen. The next time we think about rejecting this precious, precious gift, let us consider the cost to Jesus. Because of what Jesus did for us, we have the gift of prayer. Jesus paid a high price for the gift of prayer. He gave us his back to the Roman quill. He gave us his head to the thorns pressed on him. But the price was still higher. He gave us his hands and his feet to be nailed to the cross. But still the taskmaster demanded more. So he gave us his life so that you and I could have prayer and intercession. Amen. There was a writer who compared prayer to a bookmark. Amen. The bookmark is a simple tool. We use it to find our place. Regardless of how many pages in a book, if we use a bookmark properly, we can always find our place in the book. Amen. But sometimes we take the bookmark for granted until we lose it and we struggle to find our place. We take prayer for granted sometimes until we lose our place in life. Then we realize just how important prayer is. Right. A third pillar, a third <coughs> pillar of the church, proclamation. It means to proclaim, it means to witness. And the William boy said it means to tell everybody about somebody who can save anybody. Mm -hmm. Jesus left the great commission to the church. All of us are not evangelists, but all believers are witnesses. He said in his word, all authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. Go therefore and make disciples of the nation. Proclaiming God's word through action and deed requires us to make a radical change in our life. It means I have to put myself aside sometimes. David Livingston was a, a Scottish medical missionary to Africa. He died in 1873 from malaria and dysentery. He was known for his fight against slavery. He helped to open Africa for missionaries who brought education and health care to Africa. On one occasion, Dr. Livingston was sitting and he received a letter from a South African missionary society. He began to read the letter and it read, Have you found a good road to where you are? We want to know how to send some men to you. Livingston sat down and wrote a response to him. If you have men who will only come if they know there's a good road, I don't want them. I want men who will come if there are no roads. Proclaiming right. the gospel, carrying out God's purpose, means going places, doing things, associating with people that make us uncomfortable. Right. But a church that has the Great Commission mentality is willing to make these sacrifices. Somebody say he's teaching right now. <laughs> this type of church does three vital things. Number one, they see the needs of the unchurched. When Jesus saw the multitudes, he had compassion on them. We must do likewise. A church that has the Great Commission mentality must learn to establish ministries to meet the needs, not only of its members, but the needs of those who are unchurched. Pastor and some of the others have been talking about starting ministries and singles ministry and couples ministry and singles ministry. We're not just doing that to occupy the time. No, it's not just something we want to do to be churchy. That's something we're doing to upbuild the kingdom of God. So if we drop the ball while we're trying to do that, you on the same team. Pick the ball up with your wood and run with it. Yeah. A church that has the Great Commission mentality does the third thing. It develops a love saturated process to draw and assimilate. And the word assimilate means to keep, to make you part of. It means to draw and keep the unchurched. It takes a certain IQ to be able to do this. And I'm not talking about intelligence, folks, that supposedly measures our intelligence. But what I'm speaking of is our invitation portion. This measures our Great Commission mentality. If you see a test like this, this is some of the questions you might see on it. And this is a, a self-test. You're 
grade yourself. I'm not going to grade you. You